Mike, I've tried to keep up with the literature in brain science over the last 40 years since I got my doctorate, and I can't. No There's one can. So much. <laughs> well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> no, it's impossible. But I really try, right. and, and I'm just right. overwhelmed. I mean, the right. genetic work, the physiology, right. uh, the, the the computational neuroscience. Right. Uh, how do? How can we begin to get our hands around it, it, the, the the whole question about about uh, how how to how to understand the brain? I think it's point. getting beyond us in a sense. You know, I'm not sure anyone is smart enough any any longer to integrate it all together. It's one of the great challenges we have because they have this incredible growth of information, especially about the details of process, you know, largely driven by an, a, a by reductionist science, you could say, that's really trying to get to the fundamental aspects of the molecular and, and cellular processes mm -hmm. that contribute to brain function. And then there's also been a marvelous growth of brain science that relates to the operations of the brain as a controlling machine, as a perceiving machine, as a thinking machine. And there's a, a wonderful array of studies in the last, largely in the last 10 or 15 years that have revolutionized how we think of the brain as an adaptive machine. You know, historically, we thought of the brain as being something like a computer right. that developed its fixed processes and connections, neurons matured in very early life. And beyond that early period, we had something that was operating with unknown algorithms and unknown operating system in a sense. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we had to account for every marvelous thing the brain did uh, given those unknown processes. Mm -hmm. And now we realize that that's a complete misconception. To the contrary, the brain is a machine that organizes itself in detail. So what you see anatomically in early life is the establishment of the main trunk lines of the connections of the brain. But all of the little roads and highways and byways are not yet fully formed. And basically they're formed on the basis of the acquisition of our skills and, and experiences. They're formed by our, by our using our brain and our brain actually specializes in a myriad of ways. And that specialization accounts for the skills and abilities that define us, that define our personhood, sure. that define what we can do, that, 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 and, and to the extent to which they're not engaged, that limits, limit us and define what we can't do, right? What's fascinating is, is it's easy to understand how you can do skills, motor kinds of skills, but when you look for that type of, of, of change for personality, for experiences, for representation about things that are in the world, it, it's just astonishing. Yeah, it is astonishing. And there's been just a fabulous uh, a growth attack in trying to understand these things in human brains. Mm. And this is another part of the modern revolution. To a large extent, we've learned many of the principles of, of the operation of the brain from studies that have, that have been conducted in primates and to a substantial extent also in models of rodent and carnivore and other models. But we've actually been slowly making a transition to doing more and more sophisticated experiments in operating humans. And one of the things we can do in those humans is, is engage them in behaviors in which they're controlling or they're learning or they're changing or they're adapting or they have an illness that affects their emotional control or affects their physical control or affects their perceptual ability or, or and so forth. So increasingly we have an understanding of how the machinery is actually operating, what its rules are, what its principles are that govern this, these, these actions of the brain. So. Several questions. First, what are some of the of the uh, techniques that we use to observe? Certainly, uh, 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 functional nuclear magnetic resonance right. is has really come into its own because right. you don't have to be invasive in, in that way. Well, we do do invasive things. We actually record now in some simple experiments where it's permissible, ethically appropriate to do so from human brains directly. But, but these are in clinical cases. Yeah, these are clinical cases. But there's an intermediate class of experiments in which we, with increasing sophistication, we record signals from brains in find in increasing detail from multiple sources in brains as brains act in real time. So we can actually get a lot of information about brains moment to moment in their operations and oh. can see how information is shipped around and see how it's organized mm -hmm. as this or that simpler complex behavior arises from it, is controlled from it, is generated by it in the body. Those, what are those, some of those behaviors that have been studied? That well, way? there are many behaviors, and they go beyond simple, simple uh, make, uh, a brain making simple distinctions or controlling simple actions to, to, to a person uh, operating in the domain of thought or a person operating in the domain of what we could call reason or uh, in, in complexly organizing the rules or principle by what the brain makes a decision mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. There are many, many ways in which we, 
understand the brain operates from psychology. But one important thing that's happening is these rules of psychology, which were evolved substantially empirically, are now being slowly converted, slowly retranslated into brain process rules. And those are the real rules. No one ever told the brain about the rules of psychology or the <laughs> right. principles of philosophy. Right. It doesn't know. Or cognitive right? science. But there are real rules in there. And those rules are process rules that apply to uh, the uh, brain uh, itself. Uh, specify. So how, what, what, how are those rules expressed? Well, uh, you could say if I look in the particular operation and I look at what controls, what are the controlling factors that mm -hmm. govern the operation. Mm -hmm. So I could look at, and I could look at this and, you know, there's a thousand different sure, specific sure. examples I could cite. You know, I can actually see what is governing the changes in the brain. I can see what it takes to change the brain, to, to, to account for that change in operation or for the, for the mastery of that specific skill or for the development or, or manifestation of that particular ability. You've pioneered this concept of neuroplasticity. Right? Yeah. That is well, uh, a, a very critical understanding because the, the old accepted wisdom is that the brain doesn't change. Many anything. contributors. Yeah, there, Robert, yeah, yeah. there have been many sure, contributors sure, to the sure. science, and I'm just, yeah. you could say, one, another fisherman in the fleet. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, and I think it's been one of the most exciting things that's happened is that we now have this completely different view of how the brain is operating. We now realize that the brain is actually remodeling itself, revising itself in detail. We understand that those changes are actually massive as we evolve in our abilities. And think of it, think of its power. I mean, each one of us is born with more or less a blank slate. And each of one of us requires an incredible array of operational skills and abilities, and then loads our brain with a mass of information in a dictionary that Google you know, has trouble matching, <laughs> and then associates it in hundreds of thousands of that information, hundreds of thousands of ways to generate the sort of elaborate behaviors that define each one of us individually as different from every other person that ever was and ever will be. I mean, it's an amazing resource we have that we carry around within our skulls. Is it even possible to quantify? Well, uh, I was once asked <laughs> by a, a question that relates to that by the Dalai Lama, right? So we were, and, and I said, and he said, he, he said, the question he asked was, he said, do you think that you could define the origin of a person? And I said, well, I think we can understand all of the principles, really, by which that a person evolves. But he said, but could you understand what underlies the origin of an individual person? And, and, and of course, the obvious answer is no. Because it comes from literally trillions mm -hmm. of changes. And changes that come so individually, so wonderfully, that, that you as a person I know are not me. You're human. I'm human. But I know you're not me. And that's what makes our conversation interesting, right? It's a wonderful thing about us. Our individual differentiation as a, as a gift of this great organ. And, and you can see that as a product of this plasticity. Yes, it is a product of this. It's one of the easiest experiments to do in the world, Robert. Train an, an animal or train a human to do any new thing. Mm -hmm. Look in the brain as they improve, right? That's not a difficult experiment. It changes. And the word you, you could use to describe the change is specialization. It, it has a wonderful trick. It simply strengthens all of the connections in detail that contribute to a better try. So if I'm learning a skill, let's say I'm, I'm bouncing a ping pong ball on a paddle, mm -hmm. and I, I'm a, I'm, right. it's on a rubber band, yeah, yeah. and initially I might get a bounce or two, right? Yeah. But my brain knows what success is. It has a model of success. It's probably seen my brother or my, my, my nephew or somebody <laughs> do it successfully, right? It knows what success is. And when it sees success, it rewards itself. And it rewards itself by releasing neurotransmitters that basically tell the brain, hey, save those connections. That was a good one, right? And through a series of, you could say, first successive approximations, it saves those changes that result in a better and better performance. Ultimately, I master it. Ultimately, I can bounce the ping pong ball on my paddle in my sleep, right? It's a wonderful trick. One of the great things about it that most people do not understand is that the brain is actually controlling, it's making a judgment itself about what a good outcome is. 
And it's basically, I mean, you could say as Aristotle intu intuited, although he didn't necessarily put the faculty in the brain, physical brain itself, it's seeking the good. Mm -hmm. And basically it's driving changes that ultimately account for mastery. And it does that for ability after ability after ability. It's a wonderful trick to control your own plasticity, to control your own evolution. Can you then go to uh, intellectual things, personality things, to, and, and show the same sorts well, of things Well, of course happen. it does that too. It doesn't know that exercise in thought is, is, different. is different from, and it isn't different from right. the point of view of the processes they're of the cerebral cortex. They're and, bouncing the no, thing no, it's, a, it's the same thing. You go through a try, you evaluate the outcome, right? And you reward yourself, that is to say you save the product. You know, we've all gone through these mental exercises where ultimately we're trying to figure out how to solve problem A, right? Make a stab. Evaluate the try. Oh, not so good. Do it again. Oh, better, right? Save that one. Again, a little better. You know, you're on the path to, you could say, intellectual perfection. It's the same process. Nothing complicated.